This is the end of my act, and if you don't applaud, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> I told you, huh? I told you. Well, you've been a wonderful audience, and I don't want to stay out here too long and bore you with a lot of wonderful material. <laughs> so take it away, pal. Take it away. So when you hear it thunder, don't run under the bed. I mean the tree, cause Danny's from heaven for you. Yeah, when did you get here? As soon as I heard you're getting laughs. <laughs> hey, Hamburg, you know something? Your encore is longer than my entire act. <laughs> hey, don't you find it a little boring? What do you mean? The truth, Danny. I mean, every night's the same thing. Go out, you're a big hit. And just once, wouldn't you like to die just to see what it's like? <laughs> look, look, Jan, you wait for me in the bar. Can you wait for about four bows? No, no, no. Don't introduce me. Not you, me. I'll be right back. I was all the way up my dressing while I heard the applause. <laughs> and welcome to the third show. <laughs> I want you to know how thrilled I am to sit here and... Uh, would you please wake up that man sitting up here? <laughs> you wake up, sir. I don't mind people sleeping on a mom, but last night there was a woman down here cleaning the chicken. And this gentleman, sir, your head is shining right in my eyes. You look like a honeydew melon with legs. <laughs> I like to put my finger in your ear and go bowling. <laughs> You love it, huh? You love it. And this woman down here, the coat. What is it, mink? You think so? Wait till the wind changes. Ah, very good. Very good. Well, don't let the chef see you bread it. Wait, please. Oh, into the dungeon. Please, you don't mind. Yeah, wonderful waiters here, really. Really tip top. You don't give them a tip, they blow their top. <laughs> mm. That's a joke.
taken just before my father tried to kill himself. You can see that he was fine. It's difficult to tell from a photograph. No, I don't think so. He did two great shows that night. He could never have done that if he was insane. He did try to kill himself. That doesn't prove that he was crazy. Do you know why he attempted to take his life? No, I don't. He refuses to discuss it with anyone. Even the psychiatrist who examined him for the commitment hearing. That's probably part of the reason they committed him to the state hospital. But in the face of their opinion and his behavior, how can you be so sure they're wrong? My father and I are very close, Mr. Preston. I know him better than anyone else. I've seen him a number of times since that night. He's not crazy, I know. They, they have no right to keep him locked up with... with a bunch of lunatics. Isn't there some way to get him out? How does your mother feel about all this? They live in... different worlds. She's never understood him. My mother is doing everything she can to have him kept there. Her reaction is understandable, especially since you say your father refuses to give any assurance that he won't repeat the attempt. How can you want him released in the, in the face of what the doctors say? In spite of the chance that he may do this again and this time succeed, doesn't that trouble you? Of course it does. Do you think I want my father dead? I don't know why he tried to kill himself. But I'm sure he had a very good reason for it. And I think it's a decision that he has the right to make. Mr. Preston, please. Go see him. Talk to him. I'm sure if you do, you'll understand what I'm trying to explain. Please, just talk to him. Mr. Martin, your daughter asked us to come and see you. Well, we didn't agree to take the case, and I want you to know that I have some hesitation. Oh, sure, sure. She told me. I can understand. Now, let's talk. Uh, here's the whole bit. What do I have to do to get out of this place? Well, the procedure is quite simple. You or your daughter can request a review of the hearing. Such a request is usually acted on quickly. We have one of those hearings. No, this is different. Instead of just a judge deciding based on the opinion of a state psychiatrist, yeah. you have the right to request a jury. It's more like a regular trial. Both sides present evidence. Presided over by a judge, the jury renders its verdict. They find me saying I have to be released. Well, that's about the size of it. All right, now let's get down to business. How do I uh, convince you guys, uh, pardon me, you gentlemen, to take me on? <laughs> Listen, I, I may act that way a lot of times, but I, I'm not a lunatic. If anybody can spend time in a place like this and not lose his marbles, it must be sane. Am I right? Mr. Martin, I'm not a psychiatrist. As I understand it, there's no law against a suicide attempt. No, suicide hasn't been a crime in this state for a number of years. Hey, right on the nose. He knows what I'm talking about. So why do I have to think of motives or explain my defense or anything? We're not talking about law at the moment. What are you talking about? You're asking us to help you, to help convince a jury you're sane. Now, whether I can do that or not, uh, whether I'm able to, depends to a degree on how well I understand what's involved, how well I understand you. At least he didn't say agree with. Maybe I can make you understand. I'll, I'll explain the whole thing. You see, I... I happen to believe a man has the right to decide whether he wants to live or die. I... I don't think that society or anybody else has the right to make that decision for him. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about a kid or a nut, but I'm talking about a sane human being who's proved he can take care of himself. Now, this may sound kooky, but I... I had a reason to do what I did. And when I did it, I didn't endanger anybody. <laughs> I'm 55 years old. I'm, I'm old enough to know what I'm doing. And I have my wife and my daughter well provided for. I don't think I owe society anything. I've always been able to stand on my own two feet. And I've made lots of people's lives much happier. And I, and I live pretty good myself. Look, I want to die in my own way in my own time, for my own reasons. That all sums it up. And there's no punchline. Well, it seems to me that what you've said adds up to just the opposite. Why would a sane man who had everything to live for try to commit suicide? Sanity. I've known guys that could swear it was nutty as a fruitcake. 
But you might think that they were fine, but that's a matter of opinion, you know what I mean? And it's a matter of opinion we're talking about. The opinion of a jury. Well, that's why I want you to help me, Mr. Preston. Because I hear when it comes to jury's opinion, you're the top banana. <laughs> God, look, I, I know it isn't easy, but I'm willing to submit to any examinations a test, you know, if it can help. What do you say? Give me a little time to think about it, Mr. Martin. Sure. Well, take it over. But not too long, huh? <laughs> One more thing, Mr. Preston, I think you ought to know that I haven't changed my mind. I can't give you any guarantee about the future. All right? I think it would be easy for me to lie to you, but I think you're entitled to know the truth. I still intend to kill myself. And I still would like to know why. Goodbye, Mr. Preston. And uh, look, call me Denny. It was routine, all perfectly legal. When the police brought him to the hospital from the hotel, he was temporarily held under the mental hygiene law. You know the section. Yeah. As a danger to himself or to others. Ten days later, Judge Stone held a hearing at the hospital. Two psychiatrists testified he was mentally deranged and he was committed. Like I said, all perfectly legal. Dick, would the Attorney General's office fight a request for a release? If the hospital should say he should stay, we have no choice. Since he's the state's problem, we'll have to fight for his welfare. What about his wife? The main evidence was the psychiatric report. But when she backed it up with a testimony as to his irrational behavior and his emotional disturbance, it must have influenced the judge. One thing is clear. She wanted him put away. You're not going to do anything about having my husband released, Mr. Preston. That would be tragic. Why do you say that? Oh, I can guess what my daughter has said to you. That I'm some sort of a monster. It's impossible for her to understand, but... My only concern is for him. I'm sure it is, Mrs. Martin. And so I must insist that you leave this to me, Mr. Preston. You understand that, don't you? I'm trying to. I need all the information you can give me if I'm going to be any help to your husband. I'll see that he gets all the help that he needs. It's nice of you, but it really isn't necessary. Everything was all arranged. Blair had no right to interfere. As far as her rights go, under the law, she has a right to request a review of the first proceeding. I wasn't talking about legal rights, Mr. Preston. Do you have any idea why he attempted suicide? Of course I know. He was sick, mentally sick. I've warned him for years that he couldn't go on working the way he did. I've watched him exhausting himself night after night, anywhere, anytime, as long as there was someone to laugh and applaud. It got so that I... I couldn't bear to watch him anymore. I used to beg him, beg him to take it easy. To save something for himself, for us. But he wouldn't listen. He couldn't help himself. And so finally something had to give. He just snapped. Well, you must have sensed it. I don't pretend to be qualified to judge that. But from what I've seen and what your daughter has told me, doesn't seem likely that it could have been from overwork alone. Blair is still a child, Mr. Preston. She's always worshipped her father. She goes nearly everywhere with him. She, anything he, he does is all right. Anything he says, she believes. Mr. Preston, I want my husband to live, even if it has to be in that place. If he gets out now, he will kill himself. You've got to listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. You're so sure of that. Why? Is there something you're not telling me? Something in your relationship, perhaps? Something that might have contributed to his decision? You have no right to ask me questions like that. Stop prying into things that don't concern you. I'm not prying, Mrs. Martin. I need your cooperation. Now, what triggered his suicide attempt? Was there trouble between you? Have you ever heard of multiple myeloma, Mr. Preston? It's a form of cancer that attacks the bone marrow. He doesn't think I know about it. He might live a year, perhaps more. I wanted to have that year, that time, Mr. Preston. If you get him released, he'll kill himself. And it will be your doing. Yours and my daughter's. Two of you will have murdered my husband. Oh, that's 
excellent. Well, Father, I'm glad you enjoyed it. There's a lot of practice. Uh, I'd, I'd like to show you one more trick, which I think is sensational. All right. Pick out a card. Don't let me see it. Okay. Right. Now, look at it. Okay. What's the card? Two of spades. Right. <laughs> funny? You're very funny, I man. I knew you were going to say that, Father. Yeah. I got a trick for you, which show, is really sensational. Show me a legitimate trick. Well, I... Oh. oh. Hiya, Counselor. Uh, Counselor, I want you to meet my spiritual counselor. This is uh, Counsel Preston, Counsel Preston, Counselor Carson. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Preston. But I'm sure you have things to talk to Denny about. I'll see you. I'll see you, Father. Right. Excuse me. Sir. Did you get my note? Dr. Fisher promised me that he'd keep the results of the biopsy to himself. In light of your action, he was justified in telling your wife. Does my daughter know? No. You gotta do something for me. Will you telephone me? No, Denny. I think that's something you must do yourself. But you... Shall I call a doctor? Pull a little muscle. I'll make a production out of it. All right, Denny. Did you get anywhere with Della? She's convinced she knows what's best. Oh, she does, huh? If she keeps me locked up in here. If, if I have to wait, I'll, I'll wind up a whining, dribbling, helpless hunk of meat. And I can't do that to myself, and I can't do that to my wife and daughter. They have a right to take part in this decision. They're a part of your life. Let's drop it. When I had a conversation with you at first, I thought you understood my position, and now you're trying to sell me something. It's about time you gave me an answer. Are you going to take my case? All right, Denny. Yes, I'll represent you. Sometimes I don't understand you. Why didn't you give me a chance to discuss it with you? We did discuss it. I have to help him, but that's not the main question. It's what are his rights under the law? What's ethical? Okay, legal, ethical, how about moral? Whose morality? Yours, mine, fellow next door, the Buddhist monk who burns himself to death? The morality of the atom bomb, the trenches? Okay, suppose he gets out and then tries to kill himself. How about that? Well, suppose you were a lawyer and defended a man you knew to be guilty of murder. You want him his freedom with your energy and talent. Then he goes out and kills someone else. Now, would you, as a lawyer, be responsible? Oh, you know the answer to that. The law, not some shifting standard of morality. That's the cornerstone of our society. Morality sometimes changes overnight. Now, what's the point in arguing? We've got some work to do. Did you see him? Did you see him? No. Why? Because I knew what he wanted. What are you going to do? Nothing. What does that mean? It means I'm not going to help him. Not the way he wants. Not the way you want. between your father and me. Not anymore. Not since you helped send him away to that place even when you knew he was dying. No, don't try to answer me. I've heard it all. I wanted you to face him because I couldn't believe that you could see him there with those others and not realize what you had done. I should have known it was hopeless. You don't understand him. You never have. You couldn't keep up with him. But this changes things, doesn't it? Now you'll have your chance. You'll be able to cry over him. Now you'll be sure that he needs you. You'll have him helpless. Well, at least have the decency to admit it. What a time you're going to have. The devoted self-sacrificing wife. What do you know about what I feel for him or what he feels for me? You're not a woman. You're a child. Love. Oh, with you, that's only a word. Well, look at you. You've never even had a man, much less faced losing him. 
You think that by, by doing what Daddy wants, you prove how much you love him? I want him to live. And if that means keeping him in the hospital, I will do everything I can to keep him there. But he's going to die. Can't you understand? Daddy is going to die, piece by piece, until he's no longer a human being. He's going to die like an animal in a cage. But I won't let you do it. I won't let you do it! She wouldn't listen. Wouldn't even come to see you. Don't worry, honey. Preston said that the hearing would be set in a few days. You're really counting on that, aren't you? Of course. Why shouldn't I? Suppose they send you back here. Let's please take one thing at a time, huh? You have much pain? No, not much. They, they know what it is and they give me medication. It helps. For how long? No one understands you the way I do. No one knows what you've been going through. I, I have to run. Bye, baby. stand pretty well. They'll try to prove that I'm a nut and they'll have to prove that I'm not. That about describes it. And since this is a review of the original hearing, the burden of proof is on the Attorney General's office. I don't know if we'd have a chance to talk tomorrow before the hearing and I wanted to go over procedure with you and see if there are any questions you wanted to ask. What are our chances? That depends on the impression the jury gets of you. They'll be watching you every minute. I've been on display before. That doesn't worry me. What does worry you? What are you talking about? You're hardly listening to me. What's this? What difference does it make? Just get rid of it for me. Where did it come from? Please just get rid of it. Why? Because I don't want it around. Why didn't you use it? Because I didn't. Don't get the wrong impression. I haven't changed my mind. My daughter gave it to me. She was worried about the hearing, and she thought she was trying to be helpful. Wasn't she? I know what would happen if I took that. they trace it back to Blair, and... Look, I may be desperate, but there's no need to involve her. It's a little late to worry about involving others, Denny. Your daughter, your wife, even your lawyer. I know. I'm aware of that. I'm not so sure of that. Dr. Simons, do you have an opinion with reasonable certainty as to the mental condition of Dennis Martin at the time of his suicide attempt? We found him psychotic with pronounced suicidal tendencies. Dr. Simons is director of the psychiatric department of Beaumont. Have you had the opportunity to observe Martin during his confinement? Yes, I have. Can you state with reasonable certainty what his present mental condition is? Yes. It remains the same. Still psychotic, still suicide? Yes. There is no doubt in your mind about this? None. In your opinion, does his confinement have any relation to his future health? Yes, I'd say that Mr. Martin's continued confinement to the hospital is vital to his survival. Can you explain that, Doctor? Yes. In my opinion, if he were released at this time, 
he would repeat his suicide attempt. Repeat his suicide attempt. Thank you, Doctor. That's all. Dr. Simons, were you aware at the time of your original diagnosis and recommendation that Dennis Martin was suffering from multiple myeloma? No. But you were recently informed of this fact, were you not? Yes. This type of cancer is invariably fatal, is it not? Yes. In other words, he is certain to die in great pain. Well, there are specifics for the pain. Such as morphine? For one. Are these specifics completely effective? Well, not in every case. In other words, Denny Martin may well die in agony. It's possible. And treatment would only prolong his agony, would it not? That's possible. Knowing all this now, do you still consider his suicide attempt an indication of psychosis? Yes. Would you explain that to the jury, please? Certainly. For an individual to take his life, a break with reality must occur. Such a break is definitely psychotic. Then in your opinion, there is no such thing as a justification for suicide? Not just in my opinion. It's psychiatric fact. Well then, let us suppose that instead of having attempted to take his own life as he did, Dennis Martin were merely to refuse treatment. It would be a way of hastening his own death, would it not? Yes. Would he be considered psychotic in that case? Not necessarily. In other words, it's a matter of time and method, rather than the decision to hasten his own death. Well, that's something of an oversimplification. But as a general statement, it's true? Only as a general statement. Thank you. Your Honor, Dr. Fisher, who is Mr. Martin's personal physician, is in the courtroom. He has to leave at 4 o'clock. With Your Honor's permission, and since Mr. Freed has no objection, I'd like to put him on out of turn. Go ahead, Mr. Preston. Yes, I've been Denny Martin's physician for about 20 years. In your opinion, over the years you've known and treated him, was he ever psychotic? No. In your opinion, is he psychotic now? No. Is there something special about Denny we should know? Yes, I think so. Uh, Mr. Preston, if you or I were to spend 20 minutes in a telephone booth in Grand Central Station, making funny faces at an audience of three small children, while an impatient audience of uh, 3,000 distinguished politicians were waiting for us, or uh, if we were to march into one of the most exclusive restaurants in town uh, after they'd told us that we must wear a tie, with our jacket and pants, shirt and tie on back to front, well, we certainly would be candidates for a, a locked ward. But for Denny Martin, it's just routine. I don't think you can measure a man like that by any ordinary standards of sanity or anything else. Thank you, Doctor. Will Mrs. Della Martin take the stand? Your Honor, before the next witness is sworn, may I approach the bench with Mr. Freed? If you wish, we can retire to my chambers. That won't be necessary, Your Honor. Your Honor, I wonder if it's really necessary to put Mrs. Martin on the stand. It can only contribute to great emotional stress for all concerned. No one's making her testify. She's doing it at her own request, Your Honor. You're not obligated to call her. Mr. Freed, what do you intend to prove with this witness? Well, as his wife, her testimony as to his condition and behavior could be very valuable to the court and the jury. I'm inclined to agree with that. Uh, she's in a position to give valuable evidence. Your Honor, this isn't a criminal trial. We're not here to defend or prosecute a felon. We're trying to salvage a valuable human life. I don't think this is the way to do it. Your way of doing it seems to be to let him go free so he can kill himself. All right, gentlemen, I don't think we're going to get anywhere arguing this any further. I think that Mrs. Martin should testify, Mr. Preston. Put her on the stand, Mr. Freed. In other words, Mrs. Martin, there has been no pressure put upon you by anyone to testify here today. You're doing it voluntarily. Yes. Why, Mrs. Martin? For my husband's sake. I know this is difficult for you, so I'll try to make it brief. Do you or do you not agree with the opinions expressed here by Dr. Simons? Yes, I agree. You believe that your husband is mentally disturbed? Yes. Is your opinion based upon the diagnosis of the psychiatrist or is it based upon your own observations? Both. He'd been acting strange for a long time. He was tense, irritable, and not like himself. He's always been intensely independent. I never wanted anything done for him. I don't think he could stand it. He's always hated illness and disease. He has no patience with illness in himself or anyone else. And I think that the need to 
depend on anyone else would be intolerable to him. Mrs. Martin, do you want your husband released from the hospital? No. Will you tell the court why? Because I am certain he would try to kill himself again. Thank you, Mrs. Martin. We'll recess now for the day. We'll reconvene at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I want to caution the jury not to discuss this case among themselves. Mrs. Martin, you will resume the stand for cross-examination when we reconvene tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Pursuant to the stipulation between counsel, spectators will be excluded tomorrow as well. She didn't do me any good. I'm sure her testimony influenced the jury a great deal. How are you going to fight that? By trying to minimize her testimony. By throwing doubt on everything she said. Everything she said about me was true. Then I'll have to try to discredit her. No. You want to be free, don't you? You want to win this case. Do I have to call my wife a liar to do it? Are you kidding? Look, look at the ringer they just put her through. She was the attorney general's witness. Imagine what would happen if you get up there and cross-examine her. <laughs> Forget it, Preston. Daddy, can I speak to you? What is it, dear? It, it, it's about the medicine. Do you have it? Denny, I'm not going to apologize for what I'm doing or what I've done. But I want to try to make you understand why I have to do it. Haven't you done enough for one day? You've convinced yourself and everyone else that you've done it all for him. What is she trying to do now? Convince you? Mr. Preston, I want you to put me on the stand. That's something I'll have to discuss with your father. After her exhibition, someone has to stand up for him. Blair, that's enough. It's only the beginning! What is this, a contest with me as the prize? If you must fight, fight about something else! Don't argue about me! And don't use me as an excuse! Now, please leave me alone. The both of you. Get out. I think you'd better go to bed. I want this called off. Called off? Don't you want to get out of here? Yes, but not this way. My wife and daughter mean a great deal to me. I want this stopped. Can it be done? Of course. Are you sure that's what you want? That's what I want. I'm convinced that would be a mistake. Preston, I'm not interested in your convictions. I told you to do it, so do it. I don't think you should make a decision like this under pressure. It's very easy for you to say. You're not torn between two people that you love. Being forced to remain here isn't what bothers you most. It's being forced to confront the consequences of your own actions. To admit what you've done to the people you say you love. You claim to be a man who respects facts. Well, you'd better face them now, Denny. It may be your last chance. I'll see you in the morning. Doctor, wait a minute. Well, I see by the chart that you're fine, but your doctor needs help. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Danny, I got a hand it, dear. You just pulled a stunt I never saw a comedian do since, uh, well, since the beginning of show business. What? Imagine going through all this trouble just to get a few new doctor jokes in your act. <laughs> wait a minute. Huh? Danny, why don't you tell me? Your buddy, right? Right. You know doctor joke? 
I got a great one. The patient goes into the doctor's office, right? He's very sick. He says, doctor, he says, my shoulder. I don't know what's wrong. He says, it hurts. I can't bend it. I can't move it. It hurts. Would you please examine it? So the doctor says, sure, son, fine. He tapped him twice and says, uh-oh. He said, have you ever had this before? The patient said, yeah. The doctor said, well, well you got, got it again. again. <laughs> oh, you dog, you heard it. Oh, you nut. Where have you been? Pittsburgh. You ready? I had to open there the night after I saw you. Then I, you know me, I hate to brag, mm. I was terrific. Would I lie to you? Sensation. I was never better in my entire life. I was the audience. The worst. Of <laughs> <laughs> the... No kidding, it was really great. But you know what I couldn't believe? Uh. You ready? What do you think got the biggest laugh in my act? The feeding of the baby bit? No, no. Daddy, I haven't done that in about seven, eight months. Are you ready? The oldest, corniest bit I know. The biggest laugh. The bird calls. My impersonation of the bird calls. Oh. You do straight. Will you do straight? On. Come on, we'll do the bit right now. I can't, I'm in bed. Come on, you do it right from the bed. What's the difference? Oh. You only got one line. Uh. I think I want to give you a big part. Oh, okay. remember? And now, ladies and gentlemen, my impression of the South African uh, cuckoo bird. First, the male. <laughs> cuckoo, cuckoo. Now, the female. Cuckoo, cuckoo. Well, what's the matter? There's no difference between the male and the female. <laughs> what do you think is making him so cuckoo? <laughs> <laughs> Your biggest laugh. <laughs> beautiful, Jim, beautiful. You're terrific. Hospital food. Yeah. You know, I haven't eaten since breakfast. Why if I try a little? Yeah. <laughs> There's one thing I'm crazy about is hospital food. Sanitary. Now, I need it serious for a minute. Can I ask you a straight question, and will you level with me? Sure, Jan, go ahead. What's this all about? You know, this hospital bit and everything else. What do you mean, the hospital bit? You know, I've got my own theory about it, Danny. Would you like to hear it? Well, sure, say anything you like. Now, uh, we've been good buddies for a long time, 20, 25 years. And I know that you know show business inside out. And during the years I know you, Danny, I've watched you pull every terrific publicity bit there is in the business. But this is beautiful. The suicide attempt. Greatest publicity bit I've ever seen. You broke every front page. Publicity bit? You must be kidding, Jan. You're, you're clowning. You trying to tell me this isn't a publicity gimmick? A gimmick? Haven't you read the papers? Yeah, Denny. I read the morning paper. Well, how about why this? This is no answer. That's the answer. What are the guys at the Friars saying? Poor Denny? What, they send you down here to cheer me up, Jan? <laughs> well, save it for some other slob. Because nobody's going to hang any crepe over Danny Martin. For 30 years, I've handled every audience. I've worked in every joint ever invented. Everybody knows me. Why, when I walk out on the stage, they start laughing. And that's the way it's going to be. And that's the way I want them to remember me. Always funny. Always smiling and always laughing. Nobody's going to louse that up. Now, please, Jan, will you leave the room? i got to get dressed. i got some unfinished business to take care of. I already told you that. I only want him kept in the hospital for his own sake. Do you love your husband, Mrs. Martin? Of course. And you would do anything to keep him alive? Yes. Even distort the truth if you thought it would help? I'm not distorting the truth. Aren't you? Isn't it a fact that your husband's behavior prior to his suicide attempt was pretty much the same as it has always been? Weren't you distorting the truth when you testified otherwise? No. How often did you visit your husband at the hospital? I didn't go to see him. Would you tell us why? Because... Because I knew he would, he would try to get me to have him released. Not because you felt guilty about what you had done to him? No. Oh. <laughs> because I, I, was, I was afraid I wouldn't be able to refuse him. <laughs> because I knew what would happen if he was released. Your Honor, Mr. Preston is badgering the witness. I object to the manner of his questioning. Objection overruled. I believe that Mr. Preston is within the proper bounds. Do you feel able to continue at this point, Mrs. Martin? If you like, I can call a brief recess. I'm all right, Your Honor. Mrs. Martin, you have testified that your husband is a proud, independent man. You've spoken of your love for him. Yet you're willing to see him suffer a lingering death in the locked ward of a state hospital, most probably in great pain. I find that kind of love hard to understand. Perhaps you could explain it to the court. No. No, I'm not going to try to explain any more. It wouldn't do any good. You, you would never understand what I feel or why I feel that way. Do you think I want him kept in the hospital? Away from me at a time like this? 
Do you know what it does to me to have to fight what he wants? You're all so sure he's going to die. Well, I'm not. Because I have faith. I know what miracles medicine has achieved. I, I know they're working to discover a cure for cancer. I pray every day that it will happen in time. He... He would call that foolish and childish, praying for miracles. But what am I to do? Just say, all right, go ahead, die. <laughs> I, I sit here and I, I can't look at him. I know he's in pain. I, I can feel his despair. I love him. I don't want to live without him. I just can't let him go. I must help him. God, God will help me. Help me to help him. God must help me. <laughs> Mrs. Martin, are you able to continue? <laughs> Mrs. Martin, does your husband love you? Oh, yes. Does he love your daughter? Yes. Has it occurred to you that his reason for killing himself might not have been to spare himself, but to spare you and your daughter? The anguish of seeing him in pain. The horror of watching him die by degrees. Isn't that possible? Mrs. Martin? I don't know. I don't know. He said he had a couple of calls to make. But that he would see you later. That's right. Well, I, I walked into the bar. He was supposed to join me there. He didn't say he was going to bed or going out? No, oh, no, nothing like that. See, whenever comedians uh, go to see each other work, we usually have a couple of drinks after the show. And that night then he said, well, I told you what he said. So that you definitely expected him. That's right. And then what happened? Well, I, I walked into the bar and I... Uh, I met some friends I knew, some other performers, other comedians, and only had a few drinks. You know the way comedians are. We gabbed a little bit, told some gags and stuff, and... Well, I waited about an hour, I guess, and I finally decided I'd call his room. I did, and there was no answer. So, uh... And I checked him out with the, with the room clerk, and he told me Denny had gone up all right, so... I went up, and I started to knock on the door. And, um... Oh, and I kept knocking, and there was no answer. I began to get a little worried, and I called the manager. Oh, and we broke in, and I saw Denny lying on the floor like that. I just couldn't believe it. I still can't, Denny. Thank you, Mr. Murray. When did you get the report from Dr. Fisher? It was delivered to me just before the last show. You went on anyway? Sure I went on. They were expecting me. I guess I'm too much of a ham bone to miss making a farewell appearance. You were able to perform even though you knew of your illness. Sure, I knew, but they didn't. There's a big difference. Why did you have the report sent to your hotel instead of your home? I didn't want anybody to know in case it was bad news. Did you expect it would be bad news? Well, I was quite sure when Dr. Fisher wanted to do a biopsy. And you were prepared for the worst. May the record show the witness responded in the affirmative. In other words, you anticipated the results of the test. Yes. And you planned to kill yourself? Yes. Even before you had definite confirmation of your fears? I waited until it was confirmed, didn't I? The medicine you took, was it provided specifically for that purpose? What do you mean? They weren't something you just had lying around. No. Well, what were they? Barbiturates. What kind? I don't remember exactly. Some kind of barbiturates. Had you ever taken barbiturates before as sleeping pills? Not sure. Often? Often enough. I get so wound up after doing a show, that's the only way I can get to sleep. Then you are familiar with their effects? Yeah. They make you sleepy. How many must you take for them to make you sleepy? One is usually plenty. Usually? Do you mean you've taken more than one on occasion? Mm -hmm. A few times when I'd be worried about breaking in a new routine and I'd find myself 
pacing the floor till six o'clock in the morning. When you took the suicide dose, how long did you think it would take to be fatal? How long? I object to Mr. Preston asking the witness a question he could not be qualified to answer. He is not an expert on barbiturates. I'm not asking him as an expert, Your Honor. I want to get his state of mind at the time. Objection overruled. How long did you think it would take the pills to kill you? I don't know. I just thought I'd take them and get it over with. As quickly as possible? Absolutely. Did you think the pills would kill you immediately? Oh, a few hours, maybe. A few? Well, I don't know. A few, that's all. Two, three? Yes. Well, then why didn't you jump out of the window? What? Your room was on the 20th floor, wasn't it? Now, wait a minute. Wouldn't that have been quicker? Sure. I thought my way was just as sure. Then why did you tell Mr. Murray that you would meet him later? Well, I had to tell him something. Well, you could have told him that you were too tired. Preston, you kept me all for the night, couldn't ah. you? No, I, it never occurred to me. It must have occurred to you that after a while, Mr. Murray would begin to wonder what was detaining you. Well, I... I what are you doing to me up here, Preston? You told Mr. Murray that you had a few calls to make. Now, that wouldn't take two or three hours, no, it would it? would, no. And that's how long you thought it would take the pills to work. Preston, what are you doing to me Trying to here? show you that you didn't want to die. You're wrong. That you wanted to be found by your friend before the pills had time to be effective. You're wrong, you're wrong! That you wanted to be saved, that you wanted to be helped. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong! Now, isn't that so, Denny? I suppose so. All the simple answers. I forgot to ask the questions. The tough ones. You know, like life or death, all that stuff. Or to be or not to be. Like you've been thrown at me at when I'm sitting here. Just imagine a guy being the last one to find out that he really wants to live. Your Honor, I respectfully submit that the presumption of Dennis Martin's sanity has not been overcome. And I respectfully move for a directed verdict that Mr. Martin is not mentally ill. Motion granted. I direct a verdict in favor of the petitioner, Dennis Martin. And on the issue of his mental illness, direct a verdict that he is not mentally ill. He is hereby discharged and released from further confinement and custody.